Thank you so much for letting me come out and talk to you today. I really appreciate that. You've been somebody that I've been trying to get to for a while, and I know times, you know, things are things are hectic but with our schedules and being a dad mode but I'm super I'm, I'm super excited to make it happen because there's a lot of things I think that we could talk about that I can pick your brain on that will help out a lot of people so thanks again for coming on yeah man happy to be here and first thing I want to ask you is if you could just give me a little quick blurb of who you are for the audience and what you do for a living yeah so I uh, my name is Todd Yates I <clears throat> well I currently live in San Jose California and I am assistant vice president of compliance for like a mid-level mortgage bank. That sounds exciting. <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, trust me. Once you talk to me about it, it won't. All right. Well, since you brought that up, actually, help me understand what that whole, what that actually means, especially, I mean, we, we live in an area where these home prices are just re off the charts and yeah. we're just so used to it. We're so numb to it. But what exactly does that compliance auditor do? I'm guessing it has something to do with the whole crash that happened in 07 and 08. Yeah. Uh, I mean, mortgage regulation has been around for a long time. Uh, we, we still follow laws that are dating back to the seventies. Um, when there was a lot of, uh, let's say more conservative view about lending to people of different ethnicities. I would to put it gently, I got um, it. but like, yeah, laws were enacted back then. And then, and then, They've always been there, but within the last, I would say, 10 to 15 years, it went, it's like tenfold what it used to be. Um, so the crash really set it off in a way that the government formed like its own entity called the CFPB, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, I think is what it stands for. I don't know. I probably should know that. Something like that. Maybe, but we'll figure it out. Later. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, I think I'm right. Uh, and so they are the authority now for all of uh, consumer lending. So it's not just mortgages, which is what I do, uh, but it's also bank loans, student loans, credit cards, auto loans, all that stuff. And this one entity regulates all of that. And they write the rules, essentially. I mean, it's really you know lawmakers that write the rules, but they have heavy sway on them and you know, dictate how they're interpreted because it's like law is legal jargon and then they can interpret it in a certain way uh, gotcha. okay. based on their viewpoint. And so we have to not only manage to the law, but sometimes manage to their interpretation of the law. And so to answer your question, um, there's so many, like I was telling you before we started the podcast, there's so many aspects to compliance in mortgage now. Uh, from disclosures, like you've signed a loan for something before, right? I'm, I'm sure you have. Uh, you sign like 57 documents with, this is how much we're giving you, and this is how much you're paying us, and um, this is your credit score, and things like that. So in a mortgage loan, I don't know if you've ever bought a house before, but that's like tenfold. It, there's disclosures about the home's contents, and in California we have like, you know, mold disclosures and earthquake disclosures and flood disclosure. Oh, I mean, there's just so many to name, but there's so many areas of, uh, uh, mortgage compliance that you have to focus on. Um, the, the new hot commodity now is marketing, right? Because of the advent of social media and okay. So now we're past that technical difficulty, hopefully. Okay. And now we can go on. So remind me where we're at again about the, uh, so rude texting. Uh, I know what happens. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> about the compliance. I guess the bigger one I was going to ask you with that is that if you're like the average person who's trying to deal with trying to get a mortgage nowadays, like what is it about your role that actually pertains a lot to somebody who's interested in buying a home? Since you're not the realtor or you're not the bank, correct, you're there to make sure everything is okay. Like how do you, how does your job help out the everyday person now? So that's actually an interesting question. The compliance is there, like our internal compliance team is there to make sure you as the home buyer or consumer of whatever loan uh, doesn't get screwed. So my role, and going back to your initial question, my role in the company is to make sure that all of our people that work for us are doing kosher business essentially, right? Because we had just rampant fraud in, that caused the 08 crash essentially. Like 
a self-employed gardener making 25 grand a month buying a $500,000 home with no proof of his income or assets or anything like that was I remember when I way back when when I started like that was a common loan especially out in uh Central Valley in like the Stockton area Central and that's California, why right. yeah that's why that the crash hit that place so hard like it was like I, th- I think I read a stat somewhere that at one time after the crash happened like one in three houses were empty out there and all those new developments so it was like every third house it's like nobody living there for years just that would be such an eerie feeling if a third of your neighbors just disappeared yeah that was like Thanos snap like they're gone. <laughs> they're all gone now yeah. Uh, yeah so that's what I do I I Make sure that we as a company are following the rules and regulations that are set out by. Well, law. it's amazing how, you know, even back then in 07, that era, that era where everybody was just buying homes who had no business buying homes because they couldn't afford them, that it was still allowed to go on. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you were, you were doing that rule back then, correct? No, no I wasn't. Okay. So back then I was, um, uh, and this is where I met my wife. I got a job in like 05. Uh, as a funder and funder is the person that reviews all those documents that I just talked about. Mm -hmm. Um, It's like the loan package reviews all the documents, make sure all the signatures are kosher, et cetera, make sure the data entry and everything set correctly in the system. And then we send the money out to the escrow office or, you know, closing agent, the people that take care of the transaction between buyer and seller. Um, and then send, you know, four or $500,000 to them and then boom, you have a house, right? So that's what I was doing back then. And that's super high pressure, entry level job back then. But I was like pretty green, I guess, into that side of the mortgage business at that point. And I, it took me a while to catch into like, oh wow, there's a lot of really shady, shady stuff going on here. Like I actually know, this is reminding me of all this stuff. <laughs> Um, there was a big, I worked for Long Beach Mortgage and I don't care about to name drop them because they don't exist anymore. <laughs> um, which was a, the, the subprime, uh, lender for Washington Mutual, which used to be also used to be a bank. Oh, they, WAMU. Yeah. I remember that. WAMU. <laughs> I worked for WAMU. So, um, subprime meaning that they were less than kosher loans, like people with challenged credit or those like. They were riskier loans, essentially, like those gardeners making twenty five grand a month that right. didn't really right. Just Somebody that paper. probably defaulted on a lot of loans, their credit score is two hundred fifty or whatever. They don't have a business buying a home, but it's almost like we can get you a home, but it's gonna be this much interest, it's gonna be this much there, just to make it happen. Yeah, like interest rates back then, twelve, fifteen percent wasn't uncommon. Like it's crazy. And I, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie The Big Short. Like, I have. It directly deals with all of that. But even myself, I was, I knew people in the office that I worked with that were like making bank statements and e- editing, uh, you know, the appraisal of the home and stuff to make loans qualify. And there was just so much money getting tossed around. I know a guy that was like, actually, uh, like the FBI kicked his door down because he was like part of this ring of fraud, essentially, right? And he went to. T- to jail for a while like it's crazy oh someone so, actually went to jail during all this this whole thing oh, yeah. said, no one's going to jail but no people i actually mean, did not nobody at the top went to jail <laughs> all right all the middlemen are the ones that yeah get, all the yeah. low-level people uh yeah it's weird like a mafia style thing but um yeah that's uh i did that for a while and i bounced around to a bunch of banks through the crash because banks were going out of business left and right and uh about 2010 started working for the company I am now and I was doing just processing loans um, and then they and then I was managing the processing department and then they just asked me to start the, a disclosure desk for my company um, and fast forward I don't know what 11 years I guess uh, since then yeah 12, yeah, and actually, my now. 11 year anniversary with the company is in like a week or two. Jeez, um, congratulations! Thanks. We celebrate. Yeah, I wish <laughs> I got like a gold watch or something cool. <laughs> Not anymore nowadays. No, no, they'll <laughs> probably won't even say hi. Uh, 
but yeah. say, hey, you're happy you have a job, right? Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like that. Uh, but yeah, that's, and now I fell into, because of the disclosure desk job, fell into compliance and have been working for my boss for a long time. And now I'm the, basically her right hand managing our entire compliance department. That's pretty cool. So uh, pretty much now you have to make sure that all these, these loans are, are pretty much on point. The people who are trying to buy homes have the money that they, that they say that they have. The interest mm-hmm. rates are correct. No shenanigans are going on from somebody trying to make money off of somebody who doesn't deserve buying a home now. So You'd be surprised that, I mean, our company does a really good job of keeping, you know, everything above board. Um, like, uh, but I, I still see quite frequently loans out there with other companies because we when like something like that happens and a complaint gets filed with that agency, that CFPB agency that mm. I was talking about, it's public knowledge now. So everyone else can see that whatever bank you're working for did bad business. Uh, and they, I think they do that as like a scare tactic. Yeah. Um, but it's still like fraud is really rampant. Like not, not in the 08 level where we're going to have like a financial meltdown again, but people still try to this day to like, uh, you trying know, to make a buck buy another house that they say they're going to live in but they're really buying it as an investment property like things like even down uh, to that gotcha okay so like there's that's considered fraud right because you're misrepresenting what your intentions are with the house that's true um, so that kind of stuff gets reported and we see that even at our our company like people start to try to get one over on us all the time well let me ask you this because you probably would well you're, you're going to know more about this than i ever would here. yeah so we live in Silicon Valley where home prices here are like a million and a half for something that was built in 1965. It hasn't been, been touched and you could buy the same house in Norman, Oklahoma for about 80 grand. Yeah. And here it's like 1.5 million mm-hmm. or more. People are still buying the, these homes here. Like in your, from your, your knowledge here, where is all this money coming from? Surprisingly, it's at least true in the Bay Area that a lot of it now is cash buyers from overseas. It really, that's, that's the actual big thing now. Yeah, they they're uh buying up land as investment because we have a st- stable country and economy um that it's not uncommon that they'll especially i mean even uh, especially in these like super nice areas down in the south bay silicon valley as you say like eight million dollar houses cash offer boom cash offer for three hundred thousand dollars over you know asking price or whatever you still have, obviously, I'm sure the bulk of the business is still people trying to get their own house for themselves. But, like, I know a house on this street that was, for several years, owned by someone in China and just sat empty as, like, an in- investment, I guess. Jeez. It's still on the market? No. Did he God, the market? I love the house, too. It's absolutely beautiful. But yeah. uh, somebody lives there now. I don't know who, if they bought it or, so, like, sold it or whatever but yeah some of these houses up on this on the street are like restoration hardware perfect examples of like oh that's what it's supposed to look like huh like man people put a lot of money into the homes here. <sighs> there's I too much them. money in the world i know or some people have too much money i don't know I, I i see that here i was talking to somebody else who said that a lot of the a lot of the money that comes from the, the tech industry now is just people saying hey i work for a company that's now going public and i'm going to sell my my shares cash it out and now go buy that $3 million home with that money that otherwise I would have not normally had, which it's great for them. Unfortunately, a lot of the people who are your average blue collar workers are like, I can't, <laughs> I can't compete with that. I'd love to live here, but I can't get that much, much money. And you know, you see some people unfortunately get pushed out of the market, but from your point of view, like from your, cause you've been doing this industry, you've been doing this mortgage industry for like 15 years, right? Yeah. Any specific tip you can give to somebody who's like, your average blue collar worker like hey this is the market you're dealing with especially around around here here's how you can compete or cannot compete with so, what's going on yeah, yeah that's like a, that's a tough question like i still consider myself like a blue collar worker like I, I make decent money but like even sam and i can't afford like a house around here on our own like or we we could but we'd be like really living like strapped um so there's the good news is, I guess I'll start with the positive. The good news is that there's a ton of first time home buyer programs 
and state sponsored what they call bond programs where you can put as little as like 1% down or the state or city or county or whatever will give you give you money essentially as like a no cost loan to buy your first home um uh and as long as you live there for x amount of years or whatever it's kind of like a no cost loan they get paid back when you sell it whatever but um so there's a ton of programs out there for you know low income not necessarily it's kind of i can't say low income because you still have to have income to qualify for a loan right but um for like you know the average middle american person uh working family to be able to afford to buy a house even in the crazy bay area um but the flip side of that is the challenge is getting into a house where you're not getting like outbid i was just helping a buddy uh i i worked for a short time uh at a startup company in san francisco that was trying to make lending tech friendly so like the, the issue with doing a mortgage is it involves a ton of different people a ton of different roles a ton of man hours essentially to produce this loan that we you know then go and sell to investors on wall street etc right? right we sell it to other banks um and the so long story short, I worked for a, a company that was trying to solve that problem, right? With mm-hmm. automation, AI, technology, essentially. And I worked with a guy that was a programmer, computer engineer, whatever you want to call it. And he was trying to buy a house within the last year or so in Oakland, in like the, you know, the hills or whatever, nicer area of Oakland. And they make, you know, he's in tech, so he makes a good chunk of change. I'm mm-hmm. guessing a couple hundred thousand a year or whatever. Um, and his fiance, uh, uh, also, you know, she worked for like Virgin, I think, um, but made like decent money or whatever. Uh, and they were trying to buy a house and every house they would like get really excited about, they would bid on. And then someone would come over the top 50,000 over a hundred thousand dollars over $200,000 over. And they just gave up after. I don't know, like maybe six or eight months of trying. And then they ended up moving to Santa Barbara. Oh man. So yeah. like it's the good news is that there, if you find the house, there are programs to help you, you know, being the average working class family to get into that house. The bad news is in the Bay area specifically, that's still really a struggle because of the amount of money that's here. It's just, you know, it's kind of like in a somewhat way depressing topic that it's always like, ah, oh, you're talking to, you talk to somebody and it's like, ah, oh, man, those are the realities of living where we live that what we got to deal with or the average person has to, to deal with. And it's like, oh, man, you know, I, I told somebody, I think houses more now are commodities and they are actually things where you can invest in for have your family grow up 30 years the way our grandparents did in some cases our parents did now it's like okay if i get that now and i can flip it in two years for three hundred thousand over i make some money i go do the next one go there 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 yeah and it's, it's everything's commoditized i was thinking about that this morning when we were talking about this like podcast like my mom was essentially a single mother her, her and my dad got divorced when i was like two or something right and we lived in like a straight up log cabin in Prescott, Arizona. And I was like, cool, this is like high class white trash. Like (laughs) Abe Lincoln built this. It was, it was like a legit log cabin. Um, but then we moved from there to, uh, to Albuquerque, New Mexico, which is where I, I guess I claim to be from because I spent the majority of my life there. Um, and she bought a condo as a single mother. She was a, a a nurse for the VA. So like not making a ton of money because they don't get paid well. Uh, especially in New Mexico. Um, but she was able to buy like a pretty big condo um, on only her salary and like raise three kids in it. And like zero chance that's happening in the Bay Area. Like no way. No way here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that is the, the, the it's really just the times that we're living in now. Mm-hmm. And a lot of us have to learn to accept it around here. It's just the way it is now compared to it's not the way it was for our parents. So a lot of the advice that they give us about it it's i know that worked for you it's not working for me here yeah different environment now it's super i think that's true with everything that like 
our parents' generation dealt with, or not dealt with, they had their own struggles, challenges, whatever, but like their way of life and their knowing of that way of life is super different to what it is today. Like my mom, I've been in mortgage for like 20 years and she's, she'll still like, I'm almost 40. She'll be like, yeah, like, you know, it's never too late to go to college. And I'm just like, bachelor's degree doesn't really do what it did in 1967, does it? Like, yeah, it would. There was a time where if you had it, you could. It was your golden ticket to getting a job. Now it's everybody has it. What do you got that's different? Yeah, no, like it's required for like an entry level. I, I, I mean, my, I, I fell accidentally into my industry. But when I hear people talk about jobs, they're like, "Oh, we want bachelor's degree in you know associated field and three to five years of experience." How are you going to get the experience if you can't even get in the door to get the experience, right? And just the, the whole student loan thing. That's a whole separate conversation. We can go on about student loans forever. Just how much that it costs now just to get the bachelor degree. Oh, and crazy. then you got to get into your job and then start paying that loan back. And I knew somebody who's, she's trying to be a doctor. She's trying to be a nurse pra- practitioner. And they're, her and her husband are in their 40s, mid to late 40s. She hasn't even gotten that, that job yet. Her student loans are over 300K. Oh, yeah. For that's that like thing. probably average now, it's especially just, in the medical field unbelievable it's like that's the other side of it you, you see the these jobs that pay so much money it's like well to get that you need this education to get that education unless you come from money this is what it's going to cost you to get that and that just feeds back into the like being able to afford the house like you got to come from money to have money to make money it's uh yeah you know I, let's get off that depressing topic now <laughs> we're going in one direction this one thing i always wanted to ask you and we never got into it there too is about you're somebody that is into sneakers Oh, yeah. All right. I got to find out how you got into that because I try to get into Jordans and I never could. And I, some people are like, it's like the lifeblood with them. What's this whole thing about? How'd you get into it? And what's your collection like? Uh, so, wow, that's a lot to unpack. Um, <laughs> getting into sneakers. This sounds silly, but I'll tell a story. So uh, I remember when I was like, probably this was probably like, around 92 93 i was 10 11 um i really wanted this pair of reeboks and it was i was like 100 percent just like consumer fascination like i knew nothing about them i was just like oh flashy stuff <laughs> um but it was it was do you remember the reebok pumps yes okay i love those things so this kid. is early in the pump i think they came out in like 89 90 91 somewhere around there was the first one right but then Later on, and I don't remember the model, and I've actually been searching it for it for like the last year, but Reebok knowledge, I'm not great on. Um, uh, but there was a, a model, it was like a cross trainer, and it was called the Instapump, it, or it had technology called the Instapump, and you had the little pump thing on the tongue. But then there was like a little nozzle on the side that you let the air out with, but you could also like attach this little CO2 cartridge thing to it and pssst. Yeah, that sounds that sounds familiar. As like a 10 year old, I was like, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> and then uh, I, I got my mom bought them for me and uh, I felt like I could jump over the moon. So like, think I think that really started my fascination with shoes. But I can't say that I really got heavy into, like, sneakers until, like, the 2000s. Um, Nike was had previously tried to get into skateboarding. And I grew up in the 90s, so it was like skate culture was, like, exploding then, right? So yep. that affected me, I guess. Uh, but in the 90s, Nike tried to get into skateboarding, and they c- came out with, like, the ugliest skate shoes you've ever seen. One was literally called the Chode, and I don't know if you know what a Chode is, but... I don't know. Is that something you could say on the air? No. Uh, no. Oh, we'll figure probably out Probably not. Okay. But All right. uh, I'll just give a warning that if you go to Google search what a chode is, All right. it's not safe for work. Fair enough. Okay. okay. They called it the chode. Yeah. Okay. And there was like all kinds of horrible shoes. But To be fair, I don't know what that means to anybody who's listening. Okay. So well, you have a I'll figure it out later. You have a computer in front of you. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, so they had previously tried to get into skateboarding, but then it was just like inauthentic and they didn't connect and it failed, whatever. But then fast forward to the two thousands that a guy named Sandy Bodecker who started the new Nike skateboarding. Right. And then the model they chose to do was the dunk and the dunk was around since I think the seventies, late seventies, early eighties was, 
uh, it was a basketball shoe back then, but then they took it and modified it into a skateboarding shoe and added padding and et cetera, et cetera. And I don't know why, uh, being in a, having just moved to California at the time, uh, and being the startings of a punk band, pop punk band at the time, whatever, just kind of about that life, whatever. Uh, I still cared about shoes, but I never like collected or anything. But then I, they came out with that model and I started wearing those. Um, and I've been basically wearing that same shoe for the last like 20 years. And to answer your other question, I have about 60 pairs of uh, Nike SB and SB stands for skateboarding Nike SB dunks and then 40 other pairs of shoes so I've branched out since from dunks since then but jeez now do you collect them just to have them or are you in this resale market that I've seen some people go crazy with with no, these shoes no I collect them to wear them like right I that I want to wear the shoe because I think it looks cool it's like functional art whatever you want to call it um so you have shoes for exactly what they were designed for yeah, to wear yeah. around. Okay. I appreciate the aspect of shoe collecting to collect like as a art piece or whatever. Um, but like this hype culture FOMO society that we live in based on social media and other whatever uh, has really changed the way sneakers are. So like even I have to like sometimes – well, probably more often than not, actually, like pay resale price, not the retail, but like the resale market you were just right. talking about uh, for these shoes. So I I don't do it other than like if I know that Nike's dropping some super limited, super hyped Travis Scott shoe or whatever, I'll try for it just because I know like Travis Scott just came out with some some Jordans with his like signature reverse swoosh thing. Um. And they're selling like in my size, like thirty five hundred bucks or something. So if that shoe costs two hundred bucks and I can make thirty two hundred dollars on it to pay for other shoes or whatever, why not? Why wouldn't I try? Because that market exists. Right. So I can't sell it, say that I don't resale or resell shoes, but I don't do it to make a living. Gotcha. It just- yeah, the people that, that do do that, they're the first in line to get those those new Jordans and they put them right on eBay right away for like five times the price and people pay it. I'm like, you know what? More power to you if you can get in the resale business and you can get out ahead of the curve and well, you know that's what people want. If It's crazy. We're talking about that with like everything being commoditized, property, shoes, cars, whatever. People buy your guest on last week. They buy McLarens to sit in a garage for 10 years and then they sell it for triple the price right because then it's like a rare limited item um but technology again going back to being in the bay area like uh the bots is what created helped create this resale market because you can just set a program on your computer be sleeping in while every other sneakerhead that wants to actually like wear the shoes is up at 7 a.m trying to get that drop and they're just like uh, okay, I set a button the night before. I'll sleep in, and oh look, my bot bought ten pairs of these. That's how it works. Oh yeah, you, yeah. I didn't know that. I literally thought that if you wanted to get online to buy something that says okay, it drops at seven a.m., mm-hmm. you just had to be on seven a.m. Okay, I'll put through, and the next thing you know, it sold out in like eight microseconds. No, that, there was uh, wow. there's people that are but it's gotten so insane that people will buy. Like, what's a good example? Like, um, like an all-white Air Force One. It's like the classic. It's an iconic shoe, right? Mm-hmm. It's iconic to so many areas in, in, uh, of the country and in, in music and for a bunch of reasons. It's gotten so insane with the resale market that people will set a bot to buy every time these drop, buy like 3,500 pairs of them and just have them to hold because if they're cornering the market in that area, wherever they're in, then they can, even if they make 30, 40 bucks on top of what they paid, but you times that by 3,500, it's like still worth it for them. That is. And to actually, I know a lot about this because I know a couple people that do it, uh, not for a living, but like as a side hustle. And just to buy that bot program that we're talking about, they can range anywhere from like a few hundred bucks to like 10 grand. Unbelievable. And the people that make them will, again, 
because of this hype culture that we're in, will be like, oh, I'm only releasing 100 copies of this bot that I made. So they'll say, you know, they'll, they'll say that, and then it's 10 grand per, per purchase. And then there's so many other costs associated that they have to do to bot choose. It's almost becomes ridiculous. But if you've got enough money backing it, you can afford that, you'll make the money. There's like, there's like two things with that. One, if you're like Nike, you would think you'd have a program that would eliminate that. So, okay, you're only limited to like two pairs each or one pair each. That way we give the most you know, exposure to the most people. And the fact that the bots can still na- uh, navigate around that. So they spoof. Uh, they have so many ways of spoofing it. And again, I'm talking from an idiot's perspective. I just know like little tidbits about it. They'll spoof an address and they'll spell out street instead of ST. Or they'll... They have a bunch of different addresses they can ship to. They have a bunch of different credit cards, phone numbers, things like that. And their bot just does everything for it. And a funny story, the VP of Nike North America just, was it this year or last year, got, she resigned basically uh, because her son is a reseller and was using her credit cards to bot sneakers and would use her employee discount to go to Nike outlet stores and just like I said with the Air Force Ones buy like you know several hundred pairs of shoes at 50% off or whatever her discount was and then put them on eBay for retail price make 50% right there that is just <laughs> so it ruins Man, I, you it, would think that if she was the CEO that you wouldn't even have to have your, your, your son do that. You'd just be like, okay, let me get a couple of <laughs> pairs. Here you go, son. Happy birthday or whatever. Yeah. To have to go and do that navigation. That is. And then what do you say to your buddies who have these bots? Like, hey, smart idea or really, dude? No, I, I can see it from both sides, right? Uh, my mentality is that, like, I understand the hustle and I appreciate you trying to make money or whatever because we're all trying to make money to survive in this this area, this society, whatever you want, <laughs> yeah. live the way we want to live. Uh, but it does, it's changed the sneaker game for sure. Because like back when I started wearing dunks again, um, I could walk into like pretty much any skate shop, any, like they had them at like in the mall at like zoomies and, uh, mainland. And so you could just walk in and buy a pair. And then most times you could go to outlet stores or, these same skate shops and find them on sale so like 50 bucks and now if i want a specific colorway that they release of it it'll be anywhere from you know three to four hundred dollars to like i've got some shoes that are worth over a thousand unbelievable (laughs) and even used like i've got a pair used for like a thousand i've got a pair from oh four i think and they're beat to death jeez and probably used they're worth like Eight nine hundred bucks. How do you get your wife to approve all that? Oh, she. <laughs> that's a sticky. Oh man. Okay. No no no. It's t- fine. She actually appreciates sneakers. She likes sneakers. Uh, probably if she didn't like do what she does for a living, cutting hair, uh, and like ruin, she would ruin those shoes, just getting all hair all stuck up in them. Uh, but, like when we go out on the weekends and stuff, she'll usually wear like pair of jordans or whatever i've gotten her a bunch of shoes obviously because i'm too addicted to shoes yeah you know where to find them at you're the man to go to if i say hey you know where i can get a pair of this shoe so well, i'm coming to you to figure that out y- your wife ching they all ask me about it like oh can you, you think you can get this and like sam one of sam's family also bought so he's like helped me get pairs for her and myself and whatever so so it's who has the bot now they can <laughs> kind of they, they've I, going back to your point about like Nike doing their part of uh, battling against these bots. They do, kinda. They, 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 the, they know that the customer, the end user, the people that actually love sneakers are like super frustrated about it, but they also know that that's feeding this hype culture, this FOMO, like, oh, you got that new release, that's crazy. Um, and everyone's such a, we're in such a like consumeristic society that Everyone wants the new shoe, the new car, the new watch, the new whatever. Uh, like, I dress like an idiot. I, I just happen to like shoes. Like, I don't do anything to do fancy. I just like shoes. You yeah. know? 
it's uh no you're right about that but because it's crazy to me how much we put an emphasis on something like like shoes that we you know we wear and if you wear them every day they're gonna wear out in a year or so yeah but they go on the ground they get dirty exactly and it's become such a market or it's i think it's always been since i've been around I'm, we're like the uh, same age growing up in the early 80s and you know it's it was oh it seemed to always be there after jordan became popular it was a thing now you had to have the the jordans and then the barkley i think barkley had the pumps right Bar- uh, no, Barkley had uh, – Shaq had the pumps. Shaq with the pumps, okay. Yeah, and there was like uh, – Barkley was Reebok, I think. It, no, yeah. Reebok is the pump, but the there was all these basketball players, and, and we got this sensationalized marketing of shoes around that time. Like we had famous people wearing branded shoes before that, but it never really kicked off like – oh, I got to have Jordan shoes until that marketing thing was figured out. At least to me, I think people would have dis- like disagreements there. People that are way smarter than me about shoes. <laughs> um, but in our lifetimes, for sure, that was our first experience with like this sensationalized hero figure that was like, oh, he's wearing those shoes on court. Th- th- you could be that, right? They sell you that. That that. You want to be like Mike. Yeah, pretty much. be like Mike, exactly. Be like Mike was like such a jingle in the early 90s. Like, <laughs> and We hadn't seen anybody like him be- before, so it may make sense. If you can have anything, you can get his jersey and get his shoes. That would make you cool on the you f- court. Yep, you feel like a million dollars. Like You were the one. Man, I, just thinking about it now, like even back then, like there was the hype. I remember it, but I never got into it. Nobody I knew that I can remember got into it, but the people that, that did, it was just a whole nother. And it just got... It completely went to another level once the internet and the bots came out, and now it's just this big thing where it was before. You can go to the store and buy them for 150 bucks. Okay, here you go. Now it's mm. good luck getting it. There was people get. I mean, in our lifetimes back back then when we were kids, like there was people in the 90s getting robbed and shot and stuff. Like there were stories in the news, like yeah. in Chicago and New York, all the time about people getting robbed and shot for their jays it's nuts well, yep, that was that was crazy Th- just recently uh sorry i keep belaboring the sneaker point but uh in la there was people in line to sign up for a raffle a chance to buy shoes there was an altercation outside of like a shoe palace in la and the one of the workers that worked at shoe palace tried to step in between these two people and got shot and killed like that's crazy to me over a pair of shoes. A pair really, of, a pair of shoes. But th- that they're going to make like 100 200 bucks on? Like somebody's life never is worth, well, any amount of money, but right, like 200 bucks, or whatever it was. Like, It's a, uh, you know, it's, it brings up a whole another, another point with that about how much so many of us are willing to put ourselves out there to protect what's really property. You know, I used to work in an industry in retail where, you know what we we did was protect the assets of the company Mm -hmm. at some point you have people who were trying to fight tooth and nail to get those those assets and they were they would go to extreme measures and at some point you're like wait a minute we're we're fighting over you know this can here or that pair of shoes that cost a hundred dollars actually cost five bucks to make and we're putting ourselves out there to protect all that and it's as time has gone on and things have gotten more more expensive you really start to step back and say you know are we really going to keep fighting over these things for property? You know, a big thing around here that's been, it's been talked about in the news. I think it's going around the whole country now because of this whole sh- uh, shortage in shipments is this market for catalytic con- converters that people are just going around to random cars at night and then stealing these catalytic con- con- converters that are going to cost you and me three, $4,000 to replace. They go and sell it for 50, 100 bucks each and then melt it down for the precious metals, platinum, rhodium, palladium, or whatever is. I don't know if palladium is a real metal, but whatever's in those those. <laughs> no, those but things. you're right. It is those types of metals. It just happened two down, two houses down from us like a few weeks ago. Unbelievable. They have an old Honda Accord that's been sitting in the street so long that like you can see all the spider webs dangling off. And sure enough, they went in and cut the cat. But it's not even like you said 50, 100 bucks. But just, there's like less than a gram of platinum in a cat and they're worth like thousand bucks or something like that just that just the precious metals in there that's why they steal them but the precious metals are worth like over a thousand if not more right now because of 
how demand yeah exactly and you yeah. worked in the car part industry right so this yeah. is something that you're more familiar with with how you would order this part or what's actually in those, those things uh yeah i mean i can't really give you a breakdown of what's inside the like the, the matrix of a cat i know generally but i'm not like sciencey enough to like get in there but yeah i have always been into cars uh in my life uh i guess i got it from my dad because like when he was younger he had like a you know s- kind of hot rodded ish 55 chevy when he was probably around his early 20s or whatever and then i got into to cars and uh kind of in high school but i didn't even have a car i just like dreamed about them and weirdly got into like uh imports the, the jdm scene and this was like shortly before like the fast and the furious which everyone thinks of yeah as, when that came out i remember that that was like a that was a, a moment right and it still is that they're still doing movies about it like 20 years later i mean i think it's gone i think it's uh i want to say outworn it's welcome oh but it's jumped the shark you don't have to be general about that like <laughs> yeah th- i still love them but like I haven't even seen the new one, but apparently they go to like space. And shit. I, I don't. Like, I don't know. I stopped like at five. I think it was the one. I think it was Paul Walker's last, last one. But nothing replaces the first one because you relate to so much of the car culture in there. Like yeah. I, I had a was it ninety eight Accord when that movie came out, and you know you would just think about how cool it was to soup up these cars. And I wasn't big into the actual engine part of it. I always like to put everything on the outside, the rims, the yeah. body kit, the lights, whatever it was. It just looked cool, but I didn't change anything on the inside. But it was sort of an identity that we, that we had there. It's like most of us at that age, we don't have a lot of money. So we get the hand-me-down cars like the oh, old yeah. Civic. And that was our that was our pride and joy there. We would just dump all of our time, money, effort into there. And then when that movie came out, it was a way to, for us to say, look, it, this is actual representation of us. And we all kind of get together to show off our old, what really were older cars, but we made them into our own thing. And... I just remember all of those those car meetups now that we're talking about it and just seeing other people, what they would do to the same exact car that I have. Yeah. And you're just like, man, I want to do that. Or how did I copy that? Or how do you do How do you drive it that way? And pretty much everything on there was illegal as far as how low it was and the <laughs> intake and exhaust and the whole shebang. But it's like if you weren't driving on the street, then it wasn't on the road. So, you know, you would just appreciate it for what it was whenever you were at a car meet. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, that was just a whole new way of, of well, that was a whole new way of thinking back then about how we would just take so much pride into the cars that we had. What, what was your car back then? So was it a Civic? I think the car pride that you mentioned, like, always has been around, right? Because, like, I mentioned my dad having, yeah. like, 55. And, like, mm-hmm. people have always been doing that. It just happened to hit at the time where they made a, a ton of really cool cars in the 90s, like Japanese cars, um, which are fetching, like, ridiculous amounts of money now. Um, but, like that was our moment that was our scene when it happened when the time that we grew up um but my first car was a hand-me-down 87 honda accord horrible car (laughs) uh i still love it i love the shape of that body pop-up headlights i miss pop-up headlights so much um but it like burnt like a quart of oil a week and i didn't really have much money at the time or make much money at my little part-time jobs Uh, but like I bought my own like stereo CD player and like put nicer speakers in there. And I was so, so damn proud of that. Like I was like, and it got stolen in high school. I was so broken. Uh, The the, the car got stolen. No, the, my CD player got stolen. You didn't have the faceplate that came off. I did have the faceplate, but for whatever reason, uh, I didn't take it off that night or whatever. Oh, actually, I had stopped driving it because I just finally bought my own first car, like in senior year. Oh, okay. So it was like parked on the street in front of our house. And yeah, yeah. just remembering that, the whole idea that you would, because those, those, those cars came with no sound system, like really cheap, jangly paper speakers, whatever. Yeah. Not, nothing on there. So the first thing you had to do was you got to get a sound system in there. Sound system was and key. And then the whole idea of putting a CD player here with a detachable faceplate so no one would actually steal it. Just remember taking that thing off, putting it in its case, going into school or wherever I, I was at. Like, okay, that, no, no one's gonna steal my stereo now. Yeah. Now these these cars now, like the stereos are a lot better than what we ever used to put in our cars. Oh so yeah. There's no need to do anything to it. So you want to take it? Good luck. No one's gonna want it now. <laughs> it's ubiquitous. Yeah. That <laughs> the whole stereo car thing that was, man, that brings back a lot, lot of memories. Yeah. What was your most uh? 
you had to had a most memorable time of what you did with with your car back in the day that was legal. <laughs> what would that be like? Was it like some car meet that you went to where it just sort of like this is my experience with it. This is me and my friends getting together doing that. That really takes you back to the time of when imports were 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 a thing. Yeah, Still, this is actually pretty recent. So not like recent recent, but like much later than an eighty seven Honda Accord. Um, in I don't remember what year it came out, but Scion, remember Scion, the brand? They had like the yeah, XB, XB the X8. Bo- yeah. yeah, so I had a TC, right? The little coupe. Oh, yeah. And I modified the living hell out of that thing. It was uh, like slammed, big wheels, kind of stupid pointy camber, uh, all the cool things before it was annoying. Oh, you were that guy. Uh, well, it wasn't <laughs> like, you know, what they call demon camber. It was just like, it was slammed and there were nine and a half inch wide wheels so it had to be a little bit Ugh. to fit it. um but like turbo kit had a d-zod turbo kit on it and it was like i don't know three something like 320 horsepower to the real to, to the front wheels which was absolutely <laughs> useless in a in not only that chassis but like i think that much power in a front wheel drive car is good um so i but I put a lot of money into that car and I want to say it was so are you familiar with formula drift? No, you're familiar with drifting. Yes. Right? yes. Cause of fast and the furious. Obviously like Tokyo talking. drift. Yeah, there you go. There you yes. go. So drifting, they, they, there's a series now in the U S I think they still do it, uh, called formula drift. And there's professional drivers that they go to all these tracks around the country and they do drifting competitions and, uh, scion at that time, uh, was a manufacturer, I guess you could say, in Formula Drift. And um, so they had a team, they had two two drivers, uh, Ken Gushi and Tanner Faust. Um, and people might be familiar with Tanner Faust. He's actually did a bunch of the stunt driving in Fast and Furious. It's a weird callback. That was him? Yeah, he's, he's, he's done a bunch of it. Um, and I somehow got invited by Scion to take my car there and be in like a VIP area where they were showing off my car and another kid's car that was absolutely beautiful too um, of the first generation of the TC and they were releasing the second generation so they had a bunch of the new ones and by getting invited to this we had like full catered everything full VIP access to the Formula Drift event Uh, we had our own little separate area and paddock and all kinds of crazy stuff and all this swag and I uh, they took us for rides like hot laps in the new TC which again it's like 200 horsepower it's not like super quick or whatever right, yeah. but it was with professional racing drivers who had zero mechanical sympathy for these cars and they beat the hell out of them so it was, we were still still moving on the racetrack um, but it was just such, such a crazy day I met both of the drivers they signed a bunch of stuff for me uh, got to hang out with them and then at the very end of the day because i stayed all day they, everybody was closing up shop i'm just lingering around just drinking it all in and then i, I was like i want to take my car down to this was at uh sonoma raceway up in near napa up in wine country yeah, yeah. um i wanted to take my car down to the grandstands in you know in the pit lane to get photos of my car there because i was like oh that'll be so cool or whatever. <laughs> yeah um and they there was nobody around like i just kind of drove down there nobody said anything to me nobody was around so i took a bunch of pictures and then i was like man i wish i could just go drive on track right now and then i was like all right well i'll just drive down to the end of the pit lane and then i was like i could turn off right here i could just go on the track and say i get lost so i did <laughs> you got lost in the so track so i took my cell phone out and i pinched it in between my rearview mirror uh, this is like early iPhone, so th- I'm sure the right. footage is terrible. But pitched between my rearview mirror and the windshield, and then I did like three or four laps of the track. Nobody, like nobody's <laughs> around. That's so cool. And it's you can just hear me giggling the whole time, talking like, "Oh my god, I'm gonna get arrested!" But this is so fun. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm sure. Like, I would have gotten like kicked out, not necessarily arrested, but yeah, I did like three or four laps, and then got off and. Nobody was still around, so I just drove home. Nobody was the wiser. Or they probably were like, yeah, just let him have his fun. Yeah. Let him do his thing. I mean, why not? I, yeah, it was like, again, 
it was a, a quick, I guess, car, but like I wasn't going like flat out or anything. So, so you didn't really push the 300 horsepower to the limit. On no, because like I said, that car was super like if you really apart. <laughs> not falling apart. It was kind of it was kind of rigged together, but like it was still quick. And it, it, if you really put your foot down, you'll just spin the front tires like you yeah. could crash that car really hard very easily. But like I knew it was kind of useless in that sense. So I. I went fast, but not like 10 tenths or not, whatever. Yeah, not like the crazy what the drivers are actually doing with, with those things because they don't care about the car. They'll, yeah, you're right, drive it until it hits the pit and say, whatever, you know. Yeah. I pushed it. Yeah. And now I know what it can do if it came down to it. Yeah. That's an awesome story. And, yeah, I always wanted to take my cars on the track. And I was always so nervous about it. Okay, what if something happens and this is the car I actually drive to work every day? Like, oh, I better not. You got to do it. See, you got to do I still do track days i stopped for a really long time for various reasons but i just recently got back into it with my last car um and having this like parts company that i was helping run for a while um like super involved with it and you know one of my buddies that was a sales guy for us uh like went super hard into it him and his girlfriend she's like really fast right wow (laughs) um but like the track days like you get nervous having never gone before but then once you do it once everybody's super welcoming super nice you have questions they'll answer and then they always put you in like a beginner group right right and they'll train you what all the flags mean uh you know if there's an incident of any sort what to do where to do it um and then they'll even show you how to pass because like it's not like everybody assumes they go they think of people going to the racetrack and they're like banging doors and (laughs) <laughs> running into each yeah. other so it's so not like that like excuse me especially especially in the beginner group still they make you it's only point by passing so if you're coming up on somebody you can't pass them until they arm out the window point you by a smart okay. and they only let you do that for the beginner group in the straights and then once you advance they'll let you you know start doing point by passing in the turns if it's if it's smart to do it there and then once you get into the like really advanced groups, it's just like you should know by you now just know, yeah. if you're going to crash into them or you, you're also assuming that risk when you sign up. Right. Yeah. But it's the funnest thing ever. Like even in like your little civic would be the f- like absolute like you can beat the hell out of those cars. So you don't really have to worry about it breaking. Uh it's only 200 horsepower or whatever, but when you're going 90 miles an hour down a straight, like that's fast enough. It's fast. I, you like, know, I'm always worried about that that car, man, because I've babied it so much. You look at it right now. If you didn't know anybody, you probably think it was a 2019 or 20, just yeah. because of how clean I try to keep it. Yeah. And I'm like, man, I keep it so bone stock because I just like the original, the originality of saying I didn't touch the engine. Yeah. Didn't touch the the exhaust. It's all you know naturally aspirated. You know, as the you know as it came off the line, which is. Hard to find on pretty much any Civic SI from back in the day. Yeah, that yeah. you can do it. Usually, everybody screws it up already. They're on either super beat, like it was, you know, some dude's car forever, and he just beat the death, beat it to death. Or you got a young enthusiast with the car, and now it's completely molested, modified within an inch of its life, etc. So yeah, you're right. It's you know, you know, but then I see the new type type bars that are all turbo, and you know it. I don't know. There's something about putting a turbo in the Civic I'm not quite sure about. But then again, I'm older now, so I wouldn't go buy the Type R. It would just be, yeah. if I ever got to use it on a track, just to say I did it, I wonder how that would actually be. The They're fantastic cars. They're super, like for a front-wheel drive car, crazy capable. They better be, I mean, for that price. It's just, I see a lot of kids who buy them, and you know, you drive them around town, it's like, you don't take advantage of it in just the city streets. you got to take it to the track. Otherwise, what's the point of buying it? No, there's something to be said. Like, I don't get to go to the track very often, but my Subaru prior to this car, like, the most fun I have is driving in the canyons. And I don't go, like, crazy flat out in there either because I'm on public roads. Right. But, like, I'm definitely speeding. Like, over the speed limit of what's posted, right, it'll be 45 and I'm maybe I'm going 55, 65, whatever. But I'll do it in a smart way where I'm kind of in the middle of nowhere. Uh, so running into people's pretty slim chances and I always stay on my side of the road. I don't cut, cut yellows or anything. Uh, but that's where I have the most fun. That's like super relaxing, enjoyable to me. I'll just put on music and go for a drive and just like, I'm driving 
briskly but not like crazy where's your spot at or do you want to keep it a secret where you oh go no, no no like i mean especially in california like there's a whole culture surrounded by canyon driving because we have hills and mountains and stuff here there's they're all over the bay the most famous one that all of even you leos know about is highway nine uh down here in the south bay oh yeah the, up to alice's that's um, yeah there's but again you still get these young super bra like brave kids that'll slide their car off a cliff into a tree or whatever yeah and you're never gonna like they're either gonna do it there or they're gonna do it in you know downtown san jose into a building or something right like right i knew a kid in high school that slid his mustang into someone's house it like <laughs> shifted the frame of the what? house wow. so like there's always gonna be that uh aspect to it and i'm not saying it's smart it's never smart don't race on the streets but the canyon driving it, at like a brisk pace not necessarily crazy is i think the safest route you can go if you're not going to go to a track so it is uh no you're right it is invigorating especially when i do it on my motor, a motorcycle and you, can you really know that the thrill then. yeah it's, you know the thrill of, it's you know you're right it's definitely like just a way to get out escape uh especially when you have a daylight like this where it's 85 90 degrees and clear skies and just makes me want to say i should have brought the bike today if i could put all this equipment on there and just get <laughs> get lost on the canyons and then you go get a bite to eat at alice's up there was it 24 9 or 9 and 35 35 I've, skyline right a 35 skyline i think but right. whatever you're in the area exactly yeah. so then that's just it's a whole no, an, 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 another world there another way to escape another way to enjoy the what the car or the bike has without going stupidly overboard and then doing things you're not supposed to do yeah but just taking advantage of those of those corners and then yeah it's you're right it's a way to just escape from whatever it is that that's going on in life right yeah, now yeah yeah so that's one of like pretty much the only thing i do now is like I'll take taco on a canyon road like and he loves it like even when he was a baby he uh because sam works every saturday i would we were living in the east bay at the time and there's a really good canyon road up there um and we would just go and and again i wasn't driving like fast or dangerously at all but like i had an exhaust on the car and he would like hear the purr of the exhaust and just be like giggling and like, shifting around when we're going through the corners and then he'd be asleep in like 20 minutes he had so much fun and just pass out look at that see yeah you both have fun and then he gets to pass out like, all right good he's gone he's, <laughs> yeah. he's sleeping now i can <laughs> that's awesome yeah and it's funny how you mentioned that uh your, your son's how old again he's three and a half he's three and a half yeah that's awesome man how do you i mean this is one thing i like to ask people who in a similar way you both you know you and your wife work in industries where it can be fast-paced hectic how do you find the time to balance being parents with what your careers demand, what you bring home sometimes depending on the, on the, on the industry and balancing that with spending enough time with them? Like what's your secret or what works for you guys? I think we're pretty blessed in that sense, right? Because, uh, or I'm lucky, I guess, because, uh, I work from home and I have even pre pandemic for like the last five, six years, like my company saw pretty early that people can be just as productive at home working uh, as they can in an office. And actually, I, I feel like you're a little bit more of a slave to your computer than you would be at an office because you're like, OK, time to go home for the day. I'm done. My computer's staying there. Yeah, yeah um, that's true. Now it's like it's pretty frequent, especially in my position where it'll be like five o'clock, six o'clock. Something on is on fire. Uh, and I'll be like, I'll tell Sam, like, oh, I got to go take care of this real quick. It happens quite a bit. But the good news is that the flip side of that is, like, I'm able to take my son to daycare uh, every morning and drop him off and then pick him up at, like, you know, 4.30 or so. And then I come back and I'll work a little bit more uh, quickly. But, like, being around is pretty awesome because, like, if I step away for a minute to go spend time with with the family, then I can just easily run right back and take care of something real quick and be back. Right. So right. like if I can totally see like, you know, a plumber or whatever, like if there's an emergency, you got to go somewhere and do stuff. And I've worked in like a restoration industry a long, long time ago. And I know like how away from like life you can get by d depending on the industry you're in. So finding the time is, it's a challenge for sure with two working parents. Um, 
but we just were kind of homebodies in a sense. Like we like to go out and like, you know, take trips to the beach or the wine country or, or just do day trips or overnights places to go experience the food and the Mm -hmm. whatever culture there. But we're kind of homebodies. We, you know, just kind of chill at home. We don't have like all of my hobbies, uh, are generally at home <laughs> I guess like I just play besides like driving cars on track and stuff I do a lot of sim racing just to like that get, sounds fun get that same uh, feeling or whatever but you know not risk sliding a car into a wall exactly the whole thrill without the actual uh, yeah, yeah, I definitely see that as being a cool habit yeah there was one thing that you said with that that I was just curious for your, your, your take on I've asked a lot of people about this who or were in industries where it was just a nine to five, you go to work wherever that place is and you come home because of the pandemic or maybe because the pandemic just opened the, the, the door for everything to be acceptable. Now they're all working at home. I would think that at some point, a lot of people would say, you know what? I work from home and it was fine during the pandemic, but I need to get out of the house. I need to get back to the office. I need that social interaction. Mm-hmm. I've had a, most people have told me I'm, I don't want to go back to work. I'm cool working in front of my computer. I can go live f- an hour away from where I used to mm-hmm. work because I can buy a house out there and I'll just have my own little office and I'll be fine with that. What's your opinion on that? Do you think at some point you're like, I need to get into that environment again. I need to be around people or like, no, you know what? I'm actually cool. Just doing it the way I'm doing. It. I get my work done better, faster. Um, and I get to be at home more. Yeah, no, I definitely was before I was the former, like I want to be in the office. I want to be in the mix. I like doing things face to face, face to face. Like you mentioned doing the podcast on a zoom calls, totally different than yeah, in person usually. like this. Um, but the, I don't know if it was just that time or, or whatever, but so much stuff going on in my life. Like I preferred being at home. It was definitely an adjustment period at first. Like uh, like, oh, I, I haven't seen anybody all day or I'm still wearing my pajamas and it's like four o'clock, like that kind of stuff. Like it's takes some getting used to, but now because I have like a pretty small team that I, that reports to me and, uh, I talk to so many people in the company. It's not like I'm not talking to people all day. Like I could see like a data entry job or something like that being really rough, uh, just doing some sort of monotonous process over and over. Uh, while not talking to people. But I think, again, in the age of technology, there's so much stuff grasping for your attention at all times. We have, like, podcasts and unlimited streaming music and any movie we'd ever want to watch on our phones or our TVs or whatever. I think a a lot of people are just, like, happy to be, like, have all that stuff going on in the background and, like, do their jobs. So there are still people that are, like, say that to me like oh man i i wish i could just go back to the office i I miss miss you know seeing people's faces or chopping it up with people at work or there's people that like travel for work a lot and they're like man i miss travel so much yeah and i do kind of like i travel a little bit for the like state examinations like i was telling you about earlier like we lend in so many states that each of them have their own rules that we have to follow and Every year, two years or stuff, they'll come in and say, like, hey, give us all your records of everything. We're going to make sure it's all kosher. Um, and I would – I've uh, uh, traveled, a f- I don't know, a fair amount for that. Um, the last time I did, though, was, like, literally right before the lockdown. I was in Vegas. Uh, Nevada was auditing us, and I was in Henderson, actually, but, like, it's pretty much the same thing. Uh, and I was there for a week or, I don't know, three four days. Um, like, I don't know, like a week or two, three weeks before the lockdown. And then like the whole world stopped. It was, yeah. so it was, it's weird to think about like having to travel now. It's going to happen at some point where I'll have to go out again. And we've been such homebodies. That's going to be a weird experience. We haven't done any travel at all, except for, you know, driving just outside the bay to go check a spot out. Like, Road trips, yeah. I, I yeah. seen the post you've been putting on with you and your son. That's pretty cool. Just find like the observatory you guys went to, and just how you made a day of it. Like that was pretty cool that you can, that you guys had the time to do that, to go show them different places, and really be able to enjoy it. That's but, Saturday. So that, that's uh, I try to find something interesting to do for him every Saturday because my wife's at work, and like again, it's 
fun for me too because generally getting to all those places around here means you're driving in the canyons so it's still cool for me uh but yeah the lick observatory we drove up to and super crazy twisty road up there uh it was really surreal to see the fire damage there from last year like it got within feet of the observatory and somehow they saved it It that's right but yeah so i every saturday i was try to do something that's hopefully memorable with with him because sitting at home watching tv rotting his brain it's just no bueno it's uh i guess it's something that a lot of people who are parents now have to consider is that you know back in the day it was when you were a kid and you were seven eight years old you was like okay go outside and play go with your friends go do you know go get injured playing basketball or yeah. something. that's just kind of what we did as kids and now we're at a point where because we have so much tech technology it's just uh I don't know if we don't push our kids enough as as a whole or it's that we get too reliant on like iPads and computers and whatnot. And while it definitely helps a lot of the parents to be able to say, oh. here's a, you know, go watch Barney or whatever on this so I can go do my, my, my work. We're like, how does this affect the kids later on down in life? And we don't really know yet. Or is that something you really, you guys think about a lot about how, you know, how do we balance this and that? Or, you know, as long as we take them out, hey, you know, we know we're spending that time with them. Oh, 100%. Even when like, on the days where it's like a a weekday where it's like we're working all day then we both get home five ish whatever get done with work five ish we still worry about like him sitting there watching it's so funny you mentioned barney i haven't thought about barney in so long is that still out or is that oh i don't think so (laughs) (laughs) there's a super funny video I don't know why I'm telling the story. There's a super funny video that somebody edited Tupac over a bunch of Barney clips, and it goes so perfectly together. Really? They did Tupac, <laughs> Tupac hit, with Barney. Tupac hit him up, and it's Barney to Barney videos, and it works so great. Oh, um, I gotta find that. That's now. an old classic. Um, anyway, uh, but yeah, like even when we get home, it's like there are we'd be lying if we didn't say like, oh, we're busy with something like. Here, go watch. Actually, Blippy is the new one. God, Blippy. I hate him so much. <laughs> That's annoying. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's uh, – so we, 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 we totally do on occasion. Like, hey, here's your here's your iPad or Sam's iPad, whatever. Or here's – go watch TV with Grandpa while we get stuff done. And it's saving grace that that technology is there, right? Because, like, think about, like, in the 1800s, like, <laughs> as a parent – you're just like, hey, go outside and don't get attacked by a bobcat. Like, yeah, if you they- do, run, and then <laughs> yeah. I'll find you later. <laughs> yeah, or even when they were three, what the hell did they do with kids back then? Here's like a rock. Go to town on this rock, but do whatever you want with it. Like, but uh, we we do definitely try to, you know, manage screen time or whatever. And I can't wait for him to get into video games because I still, growing up in our generation, like we grew yeah. up on video games. That's your excuse. That, oh, no, I guess I get to pull out the PlayStation again and yeah. show him how to play this game. Uh, we were, I just had to take him before we came here. I had to take him into my office where my like sim racing rig is. And he was like, can I please sit in your chair? Can I please sit in your chair? He wanted to press all the buttons and stuff. And I was like, yeah, but we got to go, buddy. So I'm really excited for him to get into video games for that aspect so I can teach him about that stuff. But then we still have to manage, uh, you know, time with it, right? Because they need, I feel like, kind of what your point was earlier like i don't think parents push kids enough to have like social interaction like i know kids today that like oh yeah like i was talking to my friend and i was like oh where were you and he's like oh i was at home it was online and i'm just like that's so weird to me like you need to be out skinning your knee on a skateboard or playing basketball or collecting bugs or painting or whatever that whatever it is that you're into like you need to press your kids to do that more because it it it's just sort of blows the mind now how because of how we, we grew up it was just normal you know going out and playing basketball and street street hockey or going and play hide and seek at the school or just doing things like you said with with the rock finding something really weird and what would be stupid to be creative with it, make a game out of it. Yeah. That's kind of how we built our creativity or imagination. Yeah. Uh, but then at the same time too, like what I remember is when I had one parent that stayed home or one parent that, that worked, it seemed to be a little bit easier because mom may have already been, been home saying, Hey, I'll be here when you come home. But nowadays, especially here, both parents are working and we're both out the house. So, and there's always that, that fear Well, if little, little Joey leaves the house, there's nobody home. Is he going to be okay? Maybe it's just safer to keep him inside and, 
you know, play the video games, play, you know, play with the iPad. At least I know you're inside safe in these four walls and yeah. we can go out and do our thing. I think it's a challenge that, you know, everybody has to figure out for them themselves what work works best. But it's something that I see a lot with a lot of the young, the younger parents around here, because like you said, it takes two people just to make the bills sometimes and where we live mm -hmm. and having to balance that with ra raising a child or multiple children, especially if you don't have grandparents around to be like that extra helper. It's, you know, something that a lot of people are facing. And, you know, even in my own world, it's a, it's a question that it's like, if you don't have the same support network, how do you really balance all that? And then, you know, living where I live, you know, there's a lot of great things about living in, in downtown SF, but then there's a lot of things you don't want to expose children to out there. Right. Yeah. So you balance that with uh, what's the best thing for the children and what's the best thing for us as far as living our lives and being closer or not too close to work. Uh, I'm sure it's something that a lot of people are thinking about in some way about how to make that fine balance work. And, you know, with the, with the, with the culture that we have, with the, how much everything costs now, it's like puts us in a different world now. Where it's like, well, you know, we have tech technology to help us, but, you know, we can sometimes we can take advantage of it too much or depend too oh, much on time. it. Yeah. So who knows where that will end up being with uh, the next gen a, 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 a generation. But I think what you're doing is a great thing, having the days where you take them out to see these really cool, exciting things that, you know, some kids probably don't, don't even know exist at the observatory, the Lick Observatory is where, like. 30 miles or 30 minutes away because you're going up the hills like it's so close yeah yeah Yet some people probably wouldn't even think it even exists and that you can go and find these little places even right around here and be able to enjoy an experience with your with your son so i think that's totally cool um yeah i couldn't really couldn't really think of a better way to you know experience the great outdoors now with uh with your children other than just getting out there and getting lost and like i say getting lost in the canyons yeah and no, i I can't wait until he's a bit older. Then we can start taking him camping. Like I grew up camping a lot with my family and like, I don't really like fishing. Like I appreciate it, but I don't like to do it necessarily. Um, but I grew up out in the woods, like doing that a bunch with my family and like to go out in nature and <clears throat> not like an avid hiker, but I really like being out in the mountains. Like I grew up skiing. That was like my thing. Uh, skiing and hockey when I was a kid and like that was Albuquerque it, weirdly enough yeah that's right there are mountains out there you're it's it's like a, uh it's almost two miles high like they, they always call it Denver uh the mile high the mile, city mile high city but like Albuquerque at least the top side of Albuquerque is a mile high and then the mountain is actually over 10,000 feet so it's like a real it, it's funny when people talk about like Mount Diablo and stuff here because that's not a mountain that's a hill Yes. <laughs> like that Sandia Mountains, which is part of the Rocky Mountain Range, like that's a real, real mountain to me. So I just know Albuquerque from Breaking Bad. That's everyone's. <laughs> so, fun story. Um, my sister and my brother in law still live in Albuquerque, as does my mom. But a few years ago, uh, partially because of my wife's family's influence, um, they started a donut shop in Albuquerque. Uh, called Two Boys Donuts. Shout out Gene Bryan. <laughs> um, they have started to grow like a little bit of an empire there. Like they just opened a second shop. They're op they're in the process of building three more. They have like a donut food truck that they take everywhere. And last night, my sister texts me. Is like, no way. Uh, the production assistant for Better Call Saul. You know the yeah, spinoff series. The off spin, yeah. Um, is text us and wants us to cater tonight and they've been doing this a few times now because netflix has a big studio lot in albuquerque actually all the major hollywood studios have lots in albuquerque now because of the landscape there really oh, the yeah. desert and uh it's like uh like terminator the last terminator movie was filmed in albuquerque or outside of albuquerque and uh How anywhere you need like southwesterny mountains desert type stuff that uh new mexico is really beautiful for that so they have lots there and they last night they catered again for the better call Saul show and they got like a signed picture from what's his name bob odenkirk the the lawyer that's, that's the lawyer Saul. yeah okay see he's still doing that wow so <laughs> cool i didn't know that show was still on the air actually but um i didn't know either i thought it faded away after breaking bad like yeah here's two seasons of better call Saul, and that'd be the end of it but still going that's pretty cool yeah yeah so they they're like really heavily rooted in albuquerque and it's funny that everyone's perception of albuquerque now is like oh it's just it's meth everywhere like 
it's uh it's a really cool city it has its challenges just like every every other place does but um yeah it's it's weird to like finally have the general public when i tell them about Albu- albuquerque like kind of know oh yeah albuquerque is from that show like <laughs> it's from said. that show yeah we like, just know it's the meth capital right and you're <laughs> like uh it's actually more than you know you know yeah you're right it has its challenges but there's actually a lot of cool things in albuquerque yeah the fact that you could snowboard and then st- still say you're in the high de- desert that's pretty cool yeah there's like a real full ski area just like 45 minutes away from albuquerque Man, and I, it's probably it's probably a hidden gem too. Like if you wanted to go snowboarding, but you don't want to pay, you don't want to go fly to and pay the crazy prices to Aspen or tell you ride. It's like what? Oh Just no, I can't there. say that. The snow's not great. There. Oh okay. Like there was a El Nino or whatever that weather pattern was what happened in, when I was in high school. So there was like two or three good, really really good years of snow there. So it was like, oh, this is dope. But generally, it's like decent. Like they, you know, they make snow. But, uh, a lot there, but like the ski resort itself is cool, but it's small. So I'd still rather go to like Tahoe. Gotcha. Or, Good for the locals for like every now and then, but you want real like packed snow. It's like okay, if you're going to Colorado, you're pretty much set. Yeah, Colorado, the, you know the Sierras here in Tahoe, like those are world class like ski resorts. That the, man, it's been yeah. so many years since I've actually been been boarding. I think three or four years since I went up there. It's just as you, as you get older, you don't have any time. And I used to go on day trips to Tahoe all the time. Okay, go yeah, up same. four in the morning and then you know ride till four p.m. and then drive back and it's like seven p.m. at night. We gotta go this year, man. I, I, you're right. We gotta go. I, I, I Even if we do board. a day trip, we gotta. Go. I haven't been in years, especially since Taco. Uh, I think I've only been once since he's been born. So. It's another reason to go. No, you're right, man. I used to go to what Sierra at Tahoe because it was the cheapest one. It was the closest one off mm-hmm. 50. And then, you know, okay, I, I don't need anything crazy. This is enough runs for me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be tired by the end of the day anyway. Yeah. And then, yeah, it's just to be young again. And you're right. We, we get so caught up in life, family, jobs, um, expenses. And it's like it just kind of falls on the wayside. And then you realize, yeah, you know, those are the things that you enjoyed a lot that you can't forget. You know, obviously you can't do them as much as you used to, but yeah, just to sure. be able to go and enjoy it once in a while again, like you're right, it's an experience that I need to, that I need to revisit again. At least I know who could have called now yeah. to make it happen. Yeah, let's do it. That sounds awesome. Well, we've been doing this for over an hour and 15 minutes. Actually, time flies. Wow, that so did much go that we, by. Yeah, so much that we talked about. I know you were like, what I am I going like, to talk about here? But I feel like we didn't even talk about much. Like we talked about mortgage and shoes and cars a little bit but like we didn't uh talk about a ton like i want to be helpful to your no i think it's amazing just just to find out things about what you're knowledgeable about or anybody is what you're passionate about like even just the little things about your job now where you might say okay it's a you know it's a job whatever it is but you know so much more about the mortgage industry that i don't and would never actually do the behind the scenes stuff that most people who would go to buy their first home don't know don't care to know it pays somebody else to figure that whole thing out but it's like just knowing the little bit of tidbits of knowledge that you have about how the system works and how you're trying to make sure it's kept in line how that actually does does affect your average everyday person who's trying to buy a home it's like this is what goes on behind the scenes you should know that if for no other reason to know that there's a lot of interest out there to make sure you get the best deal but also to prevent people who can't afford a home or shouldn't afford a home from getting trapped into that and that it's actually there for your benefit now and how much it's changed since the 07 08 crash when you're right watching the, the big short is like pretty much a spot-on uh, recreation of what happened oh, yeah, and crazy. how crazy things were when people were buying up houses they had no business affording buying it off of the equity that didn't exist and then the variable rates go up next thing you know the whole thing collapses it's mm-hmm. It was a crazy example of that. So it's actually great, a great a great knowledge. It helps me out, too, to know the little things that I like to know about when it comes time for me to invest more in the property. I mean, here it's, you know, it's like you, you feel like living here that if you don't get in now, that it's just going to go even more to the moon the next year or the year after that. And I'm like, things are probably going to correct them themselves soon. So I like to think they will be, but hopefully. Who knows? But there's always the option of like, I mean, Sam and I talk about this a lot, but like buying a house in another state. Not That's necessarily to move, but like to have a rental property because it's a, an amazing income source if you can, if you can afford that $80,000 house in Tennessee or wherever you were saying earlier, you can still rent that for whatever market is generally cover the mortgage and the expenses and or if not like break even at least. And then several years later, property values still keep going up. You've got the money to maybe 
either sell it for more and then buy your own house or or refinance it and buy another pull some money out and buy another investment property so it really is like the commoditization of of property uh has always been there and that's how you know the wealthy got wealthy in the 1800s and that's how the wealthy are getting wealthy today i mean it's the game that we're all playing now and you're right you know for some of us who live over here investing in another in another state is actually very reasonable given that and people out there may not like like us because all the property values go up but you know it is an investment and if it's something that you can't afford out here but you can afford out there it's like you know do what you got to do sometimes yeah you know for better for worse but Todd, this has been, been, uh, been exciting. I can't wait till we plan that trip to Tahoe and really get back on the slopes. It's been a couple of years. I probably forgot how to ride, but after a couple of tumbles, I'll be back into it again. There you go. Awesome, man. Uh, where can they find you at if they have any questions about uh, the mortgage industry or about you know your, your complete knowledge about cars and shoes to pick <laughs> your brain about? Uh, I have a very uninteresting Instagram uh, it's at T Yeezy so it's T-E-E-Y-E-E-Z-Y at T Yeezy perfect that's pretty much the only social media I do so well, just it's smart. pictures and of my son and shoes that's I think speaks a lot that, that you uh, put a lot by, by your uh, son out there to make you know people it's you know it sounds like simple to you but a lot of people like that and enjoy it they see here's here's an example of a father spending a lot of time with his son and putting it out there and sometimes just the things you do that may sound so simple are inspirational to a lot of people who have no clue like what else can i do to, oh look at that guy he did that that's not a bad idea <laughs> so i think it's a great thing to do and um i'm excited to see the uh, future of what you guys have planned you and your family about all the adventures you want to go on especially as time goes on with post pandemic if you want to call it that now yeah it's we'll see that when we get there and uh we'll see how it goes but yeah i'm looking forward to it but all thank right. you so much for having me on i really Enjoyed. Absolutely. Thank you for letting me come out here. I got an excuse to come out to this in nice Silicon Valley weather and enjoy it outdoors. This is pretty cool, man. So thank you for that. Uh, to anybody out there, if you like the show, please subscribe and like the video so we can pass the word on. And thank you so much, Todd. All right. Have a good one. Bye.